Hello and welcome to today's regulatory education on OSHA infection control practices. This presentation is being presented by Barb Houston and myself, Amy Shortall. After today's session, you will be able to access the infection control policies, apply specifics of infection control procedures, identify reportable infections and exposures, and implement the process for equipment cleaning. There are multiple policies regarding infection control on the Policy and Procedures site in SIP. Please carefully review these policies as they contain some very important information that you will need. The policies cover aseptic technique, bag technique, bloodborne pathogen exposure, disposal of soil dressings, equipment cleaning, hand washing, and hazardous material management. The policies also cover our hepatitis B vaccination program, infection control education, surveillance, prevention, and control, our TB prevention plan, OSHA infection and exposure control plan, specim specimen transport, standard precautions for healthcare workers, and usage and disposal of sharps. In 1995, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, issued new isolation guidelines called standard precautions. Standard precautions are applied to blood, all body fluid, secretions, excretions, non-intact skin, and mucous membranes. All are to be treated as a potential source of infection regardless of whether or not the patient has a communicable disease. CDC has classified standard precautions into two tiers. In OSHA Module 1, we will be primarily reviewing items from Tier 1, which include hand washing, basic equipment, and disposal methods. In OSHA Module 2, we will be reviewing items from both tiers, but especially those related to Tier 2. Disease-specific standard Tier 2 provides isolation guidelines with transmission categories based on airborne droplet and contact transmission of infectious disease. Let's review some of the basics of infection control in home health. Hand washing, personal protective equipment, reporting, clean versus sterile technique, patient education, and equipment cleaning. Keeping hands clean is one of the most important ways to prevent the spread of infection illness. Hand hygiene can prevent potentially fatal infections from spreading from patient to patient and from patient to healthcare worker and vice versa. Some scientists estimate that up to 80% of all infections are transmitted by hands. Germs can live on our hands for quite some time unless we clean them. Let's review a few key educational points. When should you wash your hands? before and after all physical contact with all patients, before entering your clinical equipment bag, before donning gloves and after the removal of gloves, after using the toilet, blowing your nose or covering a sneeze, before eating, drinking, handling food, serving food or smoking. Basically, you will find yourself cleaning your hands frequently during a patient visit. This is to protect both you, the patient, and your family. If your hands are not soiled, you can wash them with an antiseptic hand rub, washing your hands, rubbing them together until the gel disappears. But please remember, this hand rub is not effective with C. diff patients. If a patient has C. difficile, you must use soap and water to wash your hands. If antiseptic hand rub is not available, you can use a antibacterial or regular liquid soap and water. Antimicrobial impregnated wipes are your last choice. If your hands are soiled, you should wash them with liquid soap and water, preferably antibacterial soap. Wash them for a minimum of 15 seconds, but please avoid using a patient's bar soap. You will be issued the following equipment at orientation. Please keep your vehicle stocked with masks, goggles, gowns, caps, gloves, and shoe covers.
Gloves must be changed after each patient contact and after handling contaminated or potentially contaminated items. Gloves must be worn when cleaning reusable equipment, having direct contact with blood, body fluids, mucous membranes, or non-intact skin, and when handling items or equipment soiled or contaminated with blood or body fluids. When gloves are removed, thorough hand washing is required. Please remember, gloves do not take the place of hand washing. If a glove is torn, the glove should be removed, hands washed well, and a new glove donned. Goggles should have protective sides and should be worn if there is a possibility of splash or splatter of blood or body fluids into your eyes. Masks should be worn if there is a possibility of splash or splatter of blood or body fluids and if the patient is on respiratory precautions. If a patient has TB, an N95 or what we call a TB mask should be used. Now these must be fit tested and you can see your supervisor for this fit testing. Gowns and or shoe covers should be worn to protect clothing and shoes if there is a potential to come in contact with items soiled or contaminated with blood or body fluid or if there is a chance that there might be a splash of blood or body fluid. The bag technique policy states that you should reserve an area inside your clinical bag as a clean area that you should not bring your bag into a home infested with insects or rodents, that you should place the bag on a clean, dry workplace or use a barrier, that you should not enter your bag until your hands are washed, that you should remove needed items from the bag and place these on a clean surface, that you should clean equipment as indicated in the equipment cleaning policy and then return the items to the bag, that you should not re-enter your bag wearing soiled gloves and that you would never place the clinical bag on the floor without the use of a barrier. The equipment cleaning policy states that after each patient use of your stethoscope, BP cuff, pulse ox, or scale, that you would clean it with 70% alcohol or, if soiled, with a germicidal wipe. A new plastic sleeve for each patient should be used with your thermometer and the thermometer should be cleaned with 70% alcohol after each patient use. Your clinical or supply bag should be washed annually and cleansed with a germicidal wipe if visibly soiled. If a soiled item cannot be cleaned effectively in the patient's home as stated above, it should be placed in a barrier bag for transfer back to the office for cleaning. We're going to look at the topic of scissors for patient care. Personal bandage scissors are not allowed to be used for patient procedures such as wound care. Suture sets are available to be used per patient. Ostomy scissors are available for ostomy and negative pressure ulcer dressing changes, back changes. And scissors are to be cleaned after each use using alcohol or germicidal wipes. Please check the wound care policy for further details on that. If a patient is infected or colonized with a multi-drug resistant organism like MRSA or VRE and equipment has not been designated for the patient's use, you must clean and disinfect any equipment you use with that patient with a germicidal disposable wipe prior to replacing the equipment in your supply bag. The incidence of patients infected with C. difficile is on the rise. The germ is increasing in virulence and has a mortality rate of 14% in ages 65 to 75. The lack of diarrhea does not always mean that the patient will have a negative stool culture. If a patient has or is suspected of having C. difficile, you must use soap and water for hand washing. The hand gel is not effective against this germ. You must wear a gown and gloves. Please do not take your supply bag into the home, only items needed for the visit. You must use Clorox or disp dispatch wipes with bleach to clean any of your equipment. And I would please ask that you would review the policy on C. diff in depth so you will know all the specifics of caring for this patient. The disposal of soil dressings policy states that before you begin your wound care, you would prepare a plastic bag for the waste, then you would complete your wound care. Close the first bag or place it in a second bag if dressings are heavily soiled and if leakage is a possibility and then close the bag securely. You would then place the bag in the family's trash. 
Instruct the family in the disposal of soil dressings and bags containing soil dressings. Do not allow soil dressings to remain in an open trash receptacle in the home. Certain diseases such as hepatitis A, salmonella, influenza, and TB must be reported to the Department of Health. Certain patient infections are also reportable to the agency. Wound infections which develop 30 days or more after start of care and or require antibiotic treatment or which are identified by lab test. IV site infections which develop 10 days after start of care or at any time if the IV cannula was inserted by agency staff or urinary tract infections in patients with an indwelling urinary device. If there is an occurrence of any of these things, please complete a patient incident report or if it's a reportable dis communicable disease an employee, an employee incident report, which can all be found on the occurrence reporting site. If a staff member has a needle stick or exposure to blood or body fluids or becomes aware that they have C. difficile, MRSA, VRE, conjunctivitis, they must complete an employee incident form. Again, patient and employee infections or exposures must be reported. You go to the occurrence reporting site on SIP and complete the appropriate form. If a patient's wound care orders do not specify a sterile technique, you may use clean technique. You would use clean gloves, sterile or clean dressings and supplies, and you would wash your hands and use a clean field. If the orders do specify sterile technique, then you would do so as ordered, and if a patient is going to have an IV insertion or care or Foley insertion, then that procedure, we would always use sterile technique. If you have a specimen to transport to the laboratory, you should place that test tube or specimen container in a biohazard bag and seal it to prevent leakage. If you are using ice, then you should double bag the specimen. Place the specimen in a leak and puncture proof container or cooler with a biohazard sticker. Place the cooler in the trunk of your car or on the floorboard of your car during transport. Carry the specimen into the lab while it's still in the cooler. When you open an irrigation solution bottle, you should label it with the patient's name, the date the bottle was opened, and the expected discard date. Irrigation solutions may be used up to 30 days if they're not contaminated. If they are contaminated, of course you must discard it and open a new bottle. And please, make sure you teach the patient and family to discard the solution if they contaminate it. For infusion therapy maintenance, please review the policy. In it, you will find the specifics of site care for PICC lines, Hickman's, peripheral IVs, and Metaports. Employees must wear gloves when handling sharps. Two-handed recapping is prohibited. One-handed recapping is discouraged. If absolutely necessary to recap, apply the one-handed scoop technique. All sharps will be discarded in a leak-proof, rigid, puncture-proof container that is clearly marked. All sharps containers must be marked biohazard. Other waste is not to be disposed of in the container. All sharps should be handled as infectious. All sharps containers will be returned to the office for disposal when they have reached the fill line. Please remember to educate the patient and or caregiver on infection control specifics related to their condition, signs and symptoms of infection, what to report, and document the specifics of what you taught the patient and the patient's response and comprehension. Thank you for attending today's regulatory education on OSHA infection control practices. Do you have any questions regarding this information presented in this presentation? If you do, you can always go and read the policy and procedures on SIP and or contact your supervisor. Now please take a moment to complete the post-test so that this assignment can be completed.